London has plenty of ways to get around. There's the tube, there's the bus, there's the train. There's even, I heard rumours, a cable car somewhere out east, but that sounds incredibly unlikely to me, so, you know, forget I even mentioned it. And then there's this. Now, this is a police box, but you have to admit that the first thing you think of when you see one of these is TARDIS. They were once a common sight on the streets of London. Their actual purpose was to function as a sort of mini police station, containing a telephone and a small room that could be used as an office, a break room, or even a cell. Obviously not all at the same time, because the interior was quite small. They were first introduced in 1928 to a design by Gilbert Mackenzie Trench. In 1963, when Doctor Who first premiered, they were pretty ubiquitous. Sadly, by the end of the decade, they were becoming obsolete due to the introduction of police radios. No original police boxes can be found on the streets of London today, although these smaller police posts, containing only a telephone, can still be found at various sites around the city. In Edinburgh, they still have several of their own police boxes, which are bigger on the inside than the London ones. The box outside Earl's Court is not an original, having been built in 1996. It used to have a telephone attached, but that no longer works, so now it just serves as a mount for CCTV cameras. Within the context of Doctor Who, as any fan knows, the TARDIS is supposed to take a form that blends in with its surroundings. But it got stuck as a police box during the first serial, which was initially set in contemporary East London. The reality is that a small box that fades in and out of the scene is far cheaper than an elaborate spacecraft, but, uh, of course, over the last few decades it's become an icon of the series and of science fiction in general, particularly since it's now more famous than the police boxes it imitates. Interestingly, this question of familiarity was at the centre of a trademark dispute, also in 1996, when the BBC tried to register the TARDIS design. The Metropolitan Police objected on the grounds that it was actually their design. However, in 2002, the Patent Office ruled that they didn't really have a leg to stand on, on the grounds that they'd never registered the design themselves, and they'd had nearly 30 years to complain about Doctor Who. Of course, we all know who was really behind the complaint. So yes, just to confirm, the box outside Earl's Court is not actually a TARDIS and does not function as a time travel device. But what if I told you there actually was a time machine on the district line? Allegedly. It's one stop down the line at West Brompton. Leave the station and turn right and you'll come to Brompton Cemetery. Now, Brompton Cemetery is well worth a browse in its own right. Among the notables buried here is John Fowler, the first chief engineer of the Metropolitan Railway and pioneer of the underground. But that's not why we're here. We're here to look at the tomb of Hannah Courtoy. Courtoy was a curious figure. She was born Hannah Peters. She had three children, but she never married. In 1815, she inherited a fortune from a merchant named John Courtoy. The will was disputed, but nevertheless she inherited the money, took the name Courtoy, and lived out her life as a wealthy socialite. Her tomb is a magnificent one, in the ancient Egyptian style popular among the Victorians. Equally elaborate is the theory surrounding it. The story goes that the tomb was designed by Egyptologist Joseph Bonomi, possibly with help from one Samuel Alfred Warner, his business partner. Warner was an inventor who claimed to have devised an invisible shell that could remotely destroy ships, and which the Navy were apparently quite interested in for a time. Warner and Bonomi, the story goes on, designed Courtois' tomb in 1849 with some remarkable properties. It was a teleportation chamber, possibly linked to a series of similar tombs in other cemeteries. It could make you younger. It could travel through time. In short, it was a real-life TARDIS, although it's not clear whether it's bigger on the outside, or whether you have to take Miss Courtois' remains with you. 
To be fair, the main proponent of this theory is a composer named Stephen Coates. Actual evidence that suggests this is anything other than a world story what someone made up out of their own head is conspicuously absent. It's a fun yarn, though. However, I would add one cautionary note before dismissing this entirely. The key to the mausoleum is missing, so technically we don't know what actually is in there. Hi all. Hope you enjoyed that relatively dimensional episode of Tales from the Tube. If you did, don't forget to like, share, comment and subscribe. It fills me with joy when people do. And I'll see you soon for another Tale from the Tube.